Uh, thanks, Megan. Um, my role over this project is to assess the impact of climate change using a hydrologic model. Some of you might have a question such as why we need a model or what kind of result that we can from the hydrologic model or more importantly, how we can translate the result from model in um, practical management plans. Hopefully, I can provide all answers through my presentations. As you know, you know, waters in the wetland grows and shrink. Wetland hydrology is not steady, it is dynamic. For example, um, we have three snapshots of a wetland at a different time of at different time of year. At spring, we can see some snow. In summer, we cannot all snow melt away. In early fall, we cannot see any water in the pond. Using these three shots of photos, we can easily know that this pond, the water level of this pond declined this year and finally completely dried out. But we don't know exactly when this pond completely dried out. And we also don't know how long this pond dried out. And also we don't know whether this pond completely dried out only this year or this pond dries every year. If we have a hydrologic model that can estimate water level as a function of time, we can have an answer for those questions. For example, in the bottom panel shows a wetland water level as a function of time that we might get from a model. This plot shows only one year of hydrologic behavior of wetland. But when you use the model, we can have um, 97 years of hydrologic behavior of wetland. Only difference in between these two plots are the right panel shows only one year, but left panel shows the whole 97 years. For climate change, we know that there will be reduced snowpack, earlier snow melt, hotter and drier summers. This kind of changes in hydrology will also affect wetland hydrology. So we may expect some ponds may experience earlier drawdown and longer dry seasons. So you may think that, you know, without model, we can know that what will be happening. Yes, conceptually, we can expect this kind of things easily, but do we really know how each pond responds to climate change? Do they respond to climate change equally? If not, how temporally, spatially, differently respond to climate change? Using this simple example, we notice that there are two big questions that we wanted to address. First, we wanted to know how historically well, the wetland hydrology have changed over time. Secondly, we wanted to know how climate change impact the wetland hydrology for climate change. Using observed historical data, we may provide answer for the first questions. For example, um, our team provides observed data using field surveys and remote sensing method. When we got the data from field surveys, we have more site-specific information. Amanda and Maureen did a field surveys since, since year 2012, but if the pond doesn't have any existing data set before 2012, there is no way to reconstruct historical data set using field surveys. 
In terms of reconstructing historical wetland hydrology, remote sensing methods are better because using remote sensing method, we are able to reconstruct historical wetland hydrology back to 1970s. However, remote sensing method also have temporary special limitations. For example, remote sensing data are not available before 1970s. Even though after 1970s, sometimes we cannot apply our remote sensing method if there are lots of clouds. These observed data sets are really, really important to understand the historical behavior of wetlands. However, still there are some gaps in temporal gaps. We wanted to fill out this kind of temporal gaps. Also, we wanted to make climate change projections. So model can provide to fill out those gaps and make climate change projections. This plot shows um, existing sophisticated simulation model. When you look at in these uh, schematic maps, you can see that for given temperature and precipitation data using water balance equations, the model produced estimate runoff overflows and recharge to groundwater. Finally, estimate the water that can remain in a wetland. This is a really good um, model to provide to detail information. However, uh, building this kind of a sophisticated model requires lots of data set, lots of data to set up. And it might be a little bit hard to apply to broad area. So we wanted to, we developed it a simple but robust model that can estimate wetland water levels and can be applied to larger area. We combined a hydrologic model named BIG with observations. As the sophisticated model did, BIG hydrologic model also have water and energy balance equations in the model. So BIG hydrologic model also produced runoff base flows uh, evapotranspirations and soil moistures in different three layers. So we combined outputs from the big hydrologic model with our observations and created a regression models that estimate water levels for climate change. Let me introduce how we developed our models. However, this is not the kind of a taken, um, you may want to hear our output more than our method. So I'm trying to briefly explain how we developed this model so that you can understand how it works well. I got uh, um, observed data using field surveys for the wetland located in west side of Cascade. I also got another data set using remote sensing data for the wetland located in east side of wetland. We combined observe, observed data with the output from the big model. For example, this plot shows the five observed data um, Maureen got in year 2012. And then bottom panel shows the soil moisture that we got from the big hydrologic model for the same time period. We combine these two data set to generate a regression models. In this regression model, X is the bottom soil moisture. If we put the that X values, it produce a Y value, that is the wetland water levels. Because big hydrologic model have longer time series of the bottom soil moisture about 97 years. If we put this value into the X values, it produced the Y values, that is wetland water level for 97 years. When we switch bottom soil moisture from historical to climate change, we can get um, climate change projections for wetland water level. 
When we have more than one year of data, we use those data set to validate our model. For example, I got this data set from remote sensing. We have data from 1986 to 2011. So we divided this data set um, between calibration and validation period. We developed this um, regression model only using data from calibration period. Using the same regression model, we uh, estimate the wetland water level. And then we compare this estimated water level with observations only using validation period. As you can see, we have a pretty good R values for the period. So um, we validate our models using longer time series of data. Again, you know, we use the same regression models and then um, expanded our historical simulations back to 1960s. And then we have uh, um, climate change projections using the same climate change, same regression model. We compare the, to assess impact of climate change on wetlands, we compare historical runs with climate change scenarios. There are several ways to estimate this kind of impact of climate change on wetland. But one of the important thing is um, how much water can be maintained throughout the year in the wetland is very important. So we, calculate, we um, pick up the minimum water levels for each water year and then average those values uh, through whole our simulations. For example, we have average annual minimum water level of 22 for historical runs and 6% uh, for climate change runs. So we can notice that water level um, will, will reduce by 15% for the climate change. This plot shows the um, wetland water levels for all data set that I have. And then we made uh, maps of differences between historical and climate change runs. In this case, negative value shows the reduction in wetland water level for climate changes. So large red dot shows the bigger changes in wetland water level for climate change. When you look at this map, you can easily notice that you, know, you can see lots of big red dots west side of the cascade, but not for the east side of the cascade. Though east side of the cascade wetlands do not show very sensitive to climate change in terms of wetland water levels. However, um, we expect timing of pond drying will be changed for the wetland located in east side of cascade but we didn't do this analysis yet. And Mike will talk about that, how the timing of pond drying is very important wetland located in east side of Cascade. So from now on, I just wanna focusing on wetland located in west side Cascade. I wanted to talk about two impacts. First of all, how climate change affect the type of wetlands. And secondly, how um, climate change affect pond over drying. There are so many wetland classification out there, but we choose this kind of four types of wetland based on their hydrologic behavior. Before talk about the impact of climate change on wetland types, I think it's better to briefly talk about what this, um, how we define for these different types of wetland. First of all, um, we define ephemeral hydroperiod wetland as the pond that dry every year and which is minimum water level very early of the summer. For intermediate hydroperiod wetland, at the pond that dry for the low flow years, low precipitation years, and which is, uh, is minimum water level late summer or early fall. So some amphibians and other species live on these habitats. 
For perennial wetland, it holds uh, throughout the uh, water above the 50% of its maximum values, but sometimes it dries out for very um, dry years. The last one is the permanent wetland. It do not dry out at all. It holds water above the 70% of its maximum water volumes throughout the year. I calculated the average annual minimum water levels for all these ponds and then plot as a function of wetland minimum uh, levels. In this case, uh, when I plot like this way, there were natural break point, point between wetland types. So we used this um, natural break point as our threshold distinguish between pond types. And then I calculated average wetland water levels for climate change. And then used the same threshold to distinguish pond type. What we figured out was we about half of the intermediate hydropyrid wetland shift to the ephemeral wetland. That means the amphibians and other species that live on that hydro Period, intermediate hydro period wetland, we lost their habitat for climate change. And 22% of perennial wetland will shift to the intermediate, and 32% of permanent wetland will shift to the perennial. So we see huge shifts in the um, wetland pond types that will affect the amphibians and other species that live on their habitats. I made a geographical map using the probability of a pond drying. In this case, zero means the pond do not dry out at all. One means the pond dry every year. So when you look at the blue dots, that means it holds the water throughout the year. When you look at the historical runs, we can see lots of blue dots. But for the 2080s, lots of blue dots will disappear. To assess the most sensitive area, we make maps of differences between historical and 2080s. In this case, a uh, large number, which is a uh, red color, shows the most sensitive area to climate change. Now, we know that we can identify which area is most sensitive. And we also knew that you know, some of pond will be shipped to the other pond type. How we can use this information in climate-informed management plans? We didn't do this analysis yet, but we really, really wanted to work with you managers to support your decision-making tools. However, here is an example how we can use this information in decision-making processes. So we, we can put all pond types on the top of the um, geographical maps. In this case, when you look at the changes, there is very red boxes. We may need to focus on the wetlands inside of the, this circle. And then if they have a fish, or if this is an intermediate pond, we have to more think about that. What kind of adaptation plan we, we will do that? And then what kind of how we can prioritize which will be done first. Our result shows that we have um, the robust result based on the available data set. But we wanted to extend our approach over different ecoregions, additional wetland types, and across the longer time series to make sure that our model is really, really robust with much more data set and then more robust to our model result we really wanted to work close with you to support your decision making processes. And I will pass over to the um, uh, Regina 
Rochefort. Um, she is a uh, research scientist advice and national park services. 